Thank you, Matt. Appreciate the uh, introduction and great to meet everybody this morning. A nice, if you guys are in Ohio anyway, a nice cold, chilly winter morning. So we had a heat wave that came through and uh, I dressed not appropriately yesterday. I thought, well, we're good to go, man. And then I was freezing. So uh, we have, looks like winter has finally come again. Um, real quick in the chat, just to make sure can everybody hear my video or sorry, see my video, hear my audio clearly. Are we coming through clearly? Um, just to make sure. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, good. I'm getting some yeses. And then make sure everybody can share my, see my screen here just to make sure that the tech is working correctly. So can everybody see my slide that's up here as well? Audio good. And can you guys see the slides? All right, perfect. Um, I know sometimes with Zoom, it can, it can uh, go in and out. So, well, great to meet everybody. I'll kind of get us kicked off here and then we'll dive into the slides. So my name is Tim Warren. Uh, I'm one of the founders and CEO at a company called Helium SEO. Um, we have about 65 employees uh, across, spread across the nation. Um, and we primarily do digital marketing for midsize and enterprise brands. So we do work for PetSmart and Xavier and GeneSight and Honeywell and lots of these great brands, as well as lots of really awesome mid-size companies all over the nation. So that's what we do. So day in and day out, I get to work with entrepreneurs, I get to work with marketing teams. And so we see the world of online marketing every single day. So when Matt and I got connected to talk about, uh, and actually Ashley from Rev1 Ventures, and I got connected, you know, I said, well, where can I add value? How can I help? And really the kind of the, the overlying theme was it would be really helpful if we could talk about digital watering holes and what those are and how they work and, and most popular ones and everything about that. So uh, today we're going to talk about this concept of a digital watering hole and I'm going to introduce that here in a second as we dig in. But this is not a super, you know, this is not the official term. This is a term that, that I kind of came up with after I've, after I've worked in digital marketing for about 10 years. And we'll get into that in a second. But the goal for today, so we'll, we'll present, I'll present for probably 35, 40 minutes and walk you guys through the ideas of what are digital watering, digital watering holes? How do your, your, your perfect audience congregate online? How can you target them? What's the best ad strategies or organic strategies to do that? How do you drive more traffic to your website, to your brand? What are you looking to accomplish? And then how do you think through the math to execute on that? Because digital marketing is very math-based in today's world. Um, it all comes down to what your spend is going to be, what your conversion rate is going to be, and what your profit is going to be and making those, those numbers work. So we're going to get into all those details. I want to leave time at the end for Q&A because I'm sure you guys have a lot of very specific questions that aren't going to be answered in this talk, but I'd love to help. I'd love to, to answer whatever I can. So I want to make sure to leave time at the end for us to do that. Um, and I have tools as well. We can pull up individual websites and talk through uh, specific questions. So uh, don't be shy. Feel free to come prepared with questions because we can dig right into this. All right, let's dive in. So the idea of a digital watering hole. Okay, so so what does that mean? Well, if you think about the the you know safari. Okay, so my wife is South African, so I, I've been to Africa several times. Beautiful place, but in some of the really arid areas, right? You know, there's very little water, and so if you were a cheetah and you were going to hunt the antelope, your next meal, right? Would, would it be more intelligent to kind of wander around the desert or the brushland, uh, hopefully waiting to see a stray, you know, antelope you could attack? Or if you know every single animal has to drink to survive, where's the best place to hunt, right? You go where the, the food is, right? In this idea, when we think about digital marketing, a lot of times brands think about, I just, I got to be online, right? I got to get press and I got to run, I got to do Google ads and I got to be on Facebook and I got to do, you know, TikTok. I got to do Snapchat. I got to be on all the different things. I got to do everything, right? Well, not necessarily. It depends on your budget, but the most important thing to know at day one is where does your audience spend time online? So if you know all the giraffes and all the antelopes, whatever it is that you're going after, are all going to have to be at the watering hole at some point. Well, then the bushes I would hide in if I was a cheetah are the ones right there by the watering hole. And I'd try to sneak out and grab an unsuspecting antelope or whatever it is, right? The same thing with digital marketing. So most brands 
no matter how big they are, cannot afford to be everywhere on the web all at the same time. They just don't have the budget, it's too expensive. So they have to be selective, especially if you are early stage or your startup phase, your early stage, your you've just raised funding, your budgets are going to be limited, okay? Maybe you're a solopreneur working on your side gig from home and you've got another full-time job, your budgets are definitely gonna be limited. The more limited your budgets are, the more you have got to focus on the very best watering hole to, to market your products. If you haven't read it, there's a book called Traction. Um, I think it's a yellow cover, great Gabriel Weinstein was the author. It talks about there are 23 different traction channels businesses when you start or as you grow can leverage to grow. SEO, SEM, social media, trade shows, print, newspaper, TV, there's all the different channels, okay? Some are, are growing very outdated, right? Like I probably wouldn't rec recommend you advertising the newspaper, okay? I think that's still possible, but I probably wouldn't do that, right? Maybe TikTok is the answer for you. Maybe it's SEO. Maybe it's email marketing. Maybe it's customer referrals because you sell insurance and that's what works. There's, the traction channels are different for everybody. Uh, there are the 23 main ones. But one thing that came across, and this is true, is for every business, one or two of those will be the most effective for you, okay? So what that means is if you're gonna do digital marketing run ads and you're gonna target your customer online, one or two channels is, is more likely to work better than all the other ones combined, okay? How do you figure that out? Well, I would work backwards from the digital watering hole from the ideal customer. So what you do is you first say, okay, who's my ideal customer? Maybe it's the giraffe, okay? That's, that's what the cheetah wants to eat is the giraffe, okay? When do the giraffe, do giraffes drink that often? Yeah, they drink once a week. Okay, where are the watering holes? Well, there's here's these three watering holes. They always drink at night. Oh, okay, so I'm not gonna go to the day because they drink at night. Great, same idea, okay? Okay, who's your target audience? So think about your ideal target customer, okay? That, that ideal client prospect, right? Um, or ICP, ideal client prospect. Take that person, and then say, where does this person spend most of their time online, okay? So they spend time on Facebook. Are they on Instagram? Are they on WhatsApp? Are they on Fox News? Maybe they're on CNN, right? Maybe they're on Reddit, YouTube, House, Lifehacker. There are so many online platforms, but if you kind of start to break it down and say, okay, I'm targeting 60 to 70 year old females that are empty nesters that live in suburban areas. They're not on TikTok. They're probably not on Lifehacker either, okay? You can, you can think about where are those people probably generally spending time. They're on Facebook because they're looking at pictures of grandkids. They're on house looking at, at ways to beautify their home. They're probably subscribed to better homes and gardens. They're probably into, you know, cooking or, or things that relate to general, like that group typically is into that. Not always, but, but perhaps like, they're probably into certain sports. Maybe they're into tennis or pickleball or golf or whatever the thing is, right? Quickly make that list of, of that ideal customer and their general kind of stereotypical things, and then work backwards to figure out where they spend their time online. And that's where you should run your ads, right? Because that's probably where you're most likely to get the, the best possible chance to get your ads in front of the eyeballs where they're gonna convert, okay? Everybody with me so far? Not too difficult of a concept, but this is the idea. Okay. So just like we talked about here, here's kind of the steps in order. By the way, I know this is recorded. You don't have to write these, these, these down. You know, I'm happy to share the slides with you afterwards. Just send me an email and say slides. I'll send you the slides. But, but step number one, okay? Find the watering holes where they congregate, okay? Learn how the watering holes work. So this one's really important. Every single social media, every single platform, whether it's Google or Bing or TikTok or, you know, wherever, Fox News, they all have different ways they let you run ads they all have different price points they have different ways you could you can target that customer you have to understand how the platform works or in this case the watering holes you have to understand the rules of the watering hole so like let's say that i want to advertise on life after they probably have two types of ads native ads which are a banner ad that stays all day long that doesn't change and programmatic ads which are going to be ones that that change ads every time a new customer comes to the site they're always rotating through based on the algorithmic process. I have to decide which one I want. Programmatic ad that swaps all the time is gonna be a lot cheaper and I only pay per click. The native ad is gonna be five, 10 grand a month and it's gonna be there, but everybody's gonna see it.
Okay, so I'm going to get a lot more visibility, but it's not going to be charged based on clicks. It's probably going to just be a flat rate and native ad on the site. You'd have to decide which one you'd want to spend the money on, right? But different goals and objectives. Google's another example. You have to understand how Google works. So our company works in the, in the, the Google space a lot. That's a watering hole where we spend most of our time. Google works differently than Bing, and Google works differently than DuckDuckGo, and Google works differently than social media. Social media has very different rules. So if you want to rank spot one on YouTube, it's all about length of content that's viewed. okay? Are people liking your videos? Are they subscribed? Are they clicking the bell to get notifications? And if you have a 30 minute video, do they watch it all the way to the end, which means they're most engaged? It's not number of clicks, right? That they start your video and stop, it's start and finish. In Google, it's authority of, of your website with backlinks and content. It's a totally different algorithm, even though YouTube and Google, I mean, they're owned by the same company, right? They're all owned by Alphabet. They're two very different search engines, okay? Very different algorithms. So you have to know your, your water. This, I put this one down here, which is commit to learn the algorithm. What do I mean by that, okay? So many businesses and marketers that I've seen over the years, they want to do this. They hear the talk, they know about this, like, oh, I wanna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn how to grow my business. A new place or perfume or whatever it is, okay? Or to the cloud. Okay, we're we're back on. In terms of learning the algorithm and committing, if you kind of dabble, so if it's Google and SEO, if it's Facebook ads, if it's WhatsApp, TikTok ads, if it's any platform, I promise you, that they're not. You can't take a month and $1,000 in budget and become a true expert in how to make it work. It doesn't work that way. You've got to take the time to truly invest in it. So if you want to be great at Facebook ads, and there are businesses, I've seen a lot of very successful companies, they have one main channel. So they sell on Amazon, right? They, they have a health supplement and Amazon is their market. And they've totally mastered Amazon. That's great. But they took, every time they took years and a lot of budget to really master that. Maybe it's Google and you're going to master SEO and SEM. Maybe it's Facebook ads or social ads. Either way, you've got to commit to it. So my recommendation is once you figure out this is my channel, give it six months and be willing to give it real budget and don't give up until you've really, truly mastered it and it's still not working, then that channel may not work for you, but don't quit too soon. If you don't know how the platform works, they will take advantage of you. <laughs> Whatever the platform is, I promise you, okay? So in the case of Google, right? Um, if you don't know how Google ads work, a Google ad representative will recommend you do everything broad search, okay? What does broad match mean? Let's say that you, you're selling really custom shoes. They're gonna want you to run ads for shoes, which is super broad. It's, there's millions of types of shoes and that's not gonna lead to your ideal customer, but you're gonna get clicks and you're gonna spend your budget like that, but you're not gonna get any conversions. That's not helpful, but Google wants you to spend lots of money on ads. You don't want to spend lots of money on ads. You want to get conversions and make money. That's two different goals. So when I say they'll take advantage of you, any social platform, if you put your credit card in and you say run ads, like they will take all the money you want to give them. <laughs> but you got to know how much you want to give them and you got to make sure they run good, good ads. They're not going to guarantee that for you. So any ad platform or any place where you're going to spend marketing dollars, I'm not saying they're going to try to take advantage of you specifically, but if you don't know what you're doing and you don't do your research about your watering hole and how it works, you will probably lose money or get taken advantage of just because their goal is to get as many marketing dollars from you as they can. Um, sometimes people ask, well, should I do this myself or should I hire an agency? Both are good options. It really depends on your goals and your budget. Okay. So there are three types of agencies out there. I've done this for 10 years. So like a friend, this is what I would tell any friend, regardless of whether they ever use Helium or not. There are three types of agencies. There's kind of the solo agency owner, okay? Maybe they're a consultant, they do it on the side. Maybe they just recently left an agency role and they're kind of hanging a shingle and going out on their own. They're kind of your entry level, they're, they're starting out, or they've got some experience, but they've got a really small team, like it's basically just them. They're going to give you a lot of good customer service. They're gonna get a, you're gonna get a lot of attention. Um, their skills and knowledge is probably more limited just, just by default. 
Um, typically, the really small shops are just not as knowledgeable as the big firms. And they're going to struggle to scale with you as you scale. The benefits is they're going to be a lot cheaper. Okay. So when you start out, I wouldn't hire a big firm and pay a lot of money because they're, they're going to have way too much horsepower and the spend, the spend they're going to want you to spend and what you're going to want to spend are going to be widely too far apart. It won't be a good investment yet. So when you start out, I would start with the, the small, local, maybe one or two person shop. Once you've kind of gotten what you can get there, then I'd graduate to the next level, which is kind of the midsize agency, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. They're specialists in a couple areas and you know they're going to have mid-level budgets. And then from there, you can, you know, if your business continues to really grow, you can go to the really high level, very large agencies, you know, the 150 plus um, people and they've, they're very deep specialties and large budgets. Okay. That's kind of the progression. If you choose to do it yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you do it yourself, you're going to have to kind of go back to point number three, which is you're going to have to deeply commit to learn the algorithm. So the businesses I've seen that have done it themselves on Google or on Facebook or on Amazon or whichever their platform was. They completely mastered it. They 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 dug in, and I, it's like I've heard the story every time. The CEO or one of the owners was like, "I made this my personal mission to master this platform." Right? It became their hobby, their their leisure activity, and their job. Like they made it their like their focus, and they did it, and they learned it. But it took them years to get good at it. That's also a valid strategy, but that's just what it takes. So either you have to pay for it, or you have to do it yourself. But neither one's the right or wrong answer. <clears throat> My encouragement, guys, there would be, <coughs> excuse me, figure out if you're the person who would want to do that. Like, do you want to study Facebook algorithm and understand its bidding strategies and understand how it runs ads? Do you want to take the time to do that? Do you enjoy that? If so, yeah, do it yourself. If you know you don't like that, probably hire someone to do it for you. Uh, last thing I'll say here, even if you decide you want to hire a firm to do it yourself or do it or you can say, like, I don't want to do it myself. I would still encourage you, do not, you know, it's not like flying in an airplane where you, you get your tel ticket with Delta and you get on the plane. You're like, I don't really care how it works. I just want to get there. I don't really want to know how the landing gear and all the buttons up there in the cockpit. I don't really care about any of that. So just want to watch my movie, right? Don't do it that way. Um, that way will lead to failure probably because if you go to hire a firm, you don't really know enough about platforms and what you want to do, you're inevitably going to hire the wrong firm because you're not going to know, A, how to truly pick between really good firms and average firms because you're not going to know the right questions and you're not going to know if what they're telling you is true. So that's a big problem. <clears throat> and then number two, if you haven't done enough work to figure out your ideal customer and your platform and probably the watering holes, you're probably going to hire the wrong specialist or you're going to hire a generalist who kind of knows a little bit about everything, but they're not specialist enough in the, the platform you need. So it's probably not going to work. So I would encourage you, even if you do want to hire it out, take the time to, to figure some of this stuff out and to really ask good questions and to dig in so that when you go to hire an agency, you hire the right one. All right, let's keep going. <clears throat> Here's different, uh, there's a lot of 23 different traction channels, but some of the most you know, common ones that we, that we talk about are SEO, which is ranking organically. So SEO is when you go to Google and you type in you know, new, new black leather sofa, right? New 25 inch black leather sofa, or whatever the key is, right? Keyword is, that's SEO. And you pick everything that ranks below the ads, that's, that's SEO. SEM is search engine marketing, it's the paid ads or the product listing. So you search new black leather sofa, and all the ads that pop up at the top are called PLAs or product listing ads. The text ads are just Google ads or SEM, then everything below that's SEO. Programmatic is when you go online and you see banner ads um, that's, that change in and out. Online banner ads are called programmatic. Native are, we talked about this, but ads that are fixed on websites. You go to a blog, you see the same ad day in, day out. That's a native ad. Content marketing is a really common <clears throat> way that smaller uh, early stage businesses will start because they don't have the ad budget to really blast their ads. They start by creating really good content and then in hopes that that content will spread. That's a good strategy. It is a longer approach because it takes longer to build the content, wait for it to get traction, wait for it to get eyeballed, wait for it to get disseminated. But this, it's a pretty cost-effective way to, to do marketing. And then GMB. So if you're a localized business, so you're all about local traffic or getting people locally, Google My Business or Google Maps or GMB is a very good strategy that could work really effectively. 
All right. So what's the sniff test? So when you're going to build an app, okay. So let's just say that you're back to the one you're 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 selling uh, new sofas to 60 to 70 year old females who live in suburban areas who like pickleball and gardening. Okay, I'm super stereotypical, I know, but whatever. I'm just trying to give an example. So when you build an app, okay, whatever medium you're going to be on, okay, whichever channel you're going to you're going to advertise on, you've got to make sure that that ad matches the watering hole. Okay. So if you're running an ad on better homes and gardens, what I would do is look at all the other ads on better homes and gardens and kind of see the size, the imagery, do they move? Are they dynamic or is it just a static ad? And what are they selling? How are they doing it? What's their process? Okay. What's their creative look like? Generally, what do you see out there? The reason I would do that is this idea of a sniff test is if your ad in no way matches what other people are running on that platform, it's probably a bad, it's probably a bad thing because they're spending a lot of money and they're they're probably figuring out what works. And if yours is wildly different, maybe you're the super creative genius that came up with the like better way to do it. Maybe, but more than likely yours doesn't match what they have found works. Okay. So this idea of a sniff test is run ads that match the medium. So if you're running ads on Lifehacker, your ads should be probably content marketing based and about like how to hack a process or procedure to make life better. I wouldn't just run a banner ad with an ad to your service. That's probably not going to connect with that medium. Okay. If you're running ads on Fox News, you probably should sell something that appeals to conservatives. Running ads on CNN, you probably should sell something that appeals to more of a liberal audience. You got to know who you're marketing and the sites you're on and what's going to appeal, right? So you got to do that. We call it the SNP test. All right. There's two strategies you, you can go on the volume strategy or the profit strategy. Okay. So there's always this joke that we hear where you talk to a t-shirt company and uh, and they say, yes, we're losing money on every t-shirt, but we'll make it up with volume, right? Well, if you're losing 10 cents on every shirt, you sell a million shirts, won't you just lose 10 times, you know, a dollar or whatever it is you're losing? Like, yes, but we'll make it up with more volume. I'm like, I, what? How's that work? There's two different approaches, okay? The volume one, which is look, we're not going to make a ton of money from our ads, but we're going to get a ton of conversions. And so over time, it'll still work. Okay. So let me use kind of two different examples. So let's say you're selling a pretty inexpensive product. Like let's say you invented something that's $10.99 that you sell online and it's does it's a great product. For that, for $10.99, you're going to need to sell a lot of them to make money. And so your conversions are going to have to be very inexpensive. You can't spend $30 to convert a customer that spends $10.99, right? You lose money. So in that case, you cannot run Google ads at $12 a click because you're, there's no possible way the numbers work. So in that case, you're probably going to have to find like a, a Facebook ad strategy where you can run Facebook ads at $0.10 cents a click, get 100 clicks or, or you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 clicks. You spent $4 on marketing to get a $10.99 conversion. And if your profit margin is five dollars, you still are in the, in the black. You're still okay, right? Um, that's your kind of volume play, right? Very cheap, but a lot of ads. Or you can go for the high profit uh, approach. So maybe you sell a, um, you know, you're in the consulting space. You sell very, very high end consulting engagements, but you have to get a lot of people to see it before you get a buyer because your your product's ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars but you can spend $5,000 in ads to get the $30,000 sale, okay? So if that's the case, that's a profit-based strategy, you're going to spend more on ads typically, um, and you're going to have to get a lot more people to see it, but if your profit's high enough, you can go with the profit approach. So either one works, but you gotta know your business, okay? So if you have a restaurant that sells burritos, you gotta go with the volume play. If you have a car dealership that sells luxury cars, you probably have to go with the profit play. So my recommendation is um, to go for profit play if you have a more expensive, large ticket item, you know, five, 10K or, or more. If you have a lower cost item, you know, 100 bucks or under, probably go for the volume play. The next thing, uh, I love the slide, the, the, you know, cheetah waiting, right? Or that might be a lioness waiting, but you got to give it time, okay? One of the biggest mistakes that people that people make when they get into digital marketing and they're, they're They've heard the talk, digital watering hole. They're excited. This is great. You know, let's make this thing happen. They don't give it enough time. When Helium started our company in 2018, 
Okay, so now we've got 65 employees, we've grown. When we started and we had no employees, we made the decision we're going to invest in SEO for ourselves because we believe in this channel, obviously. It's a great medium, but we're going to invest in it, but it's going to take time. No lie, okay? We're a really good SEO company. If you Google Cincinnati SEO now, we're spot one. We've taken clients from 20,000 organic visitors to 168,000 in three years. We're good at SEO. It took us 12 months just to get on page one of doing our own SEO for Cincinnati SEO. And probably 14 months before we started getting real actual leads. That's a long time. You'd say, well, why did it take so long? Aren't you guys experts? We are. That's how long it took to get that keyword because it's a really competitive keyword. But we didn't quit after six months. We're like, ah, this isn't working. We had to give it time. We knew it would take time. And now today, right? So 15, 16, 18 months in, we started getting some really good leads from SEO. And now we get our website does really good from an SEO standpoint. We get a lot of really good leads that have led to a lot of good business. Our ROI has been hundreds of percent. But if we would have quit at month 12 because we didn't have leads yet, we would have lost out on all of that. Whether you do Facebook ads, Google organic, or print newspaper, okay? You need to do some research on the platform of how long it takes before you should see a return. It's gonna be different on all the different platforms, but you gotta be willing to give it the right amount of time. Most of the time, people quit too soon. Last analogy I'll use. Marketing is like planting a, a tree, okay? If you take the seed, you put it in the ground, put the fertilizer, you pack it down. And then like a week later, you're like, oh, is this thing growing? You open it back up and pull it out. Ah, oh, it's not growing yet. Like, come on, you know, you talk sternly to it, put it back in, pat it back down again. And then you do that every week. Your tree will literally never grow because you will, you will break the roots and you will kill it, right? It'll never grow. Instead, we all know what you have to do with seed. You know, you talk nicely to it, put it in the ground, you put the miracle grow and you water it, you know, every day. And you sit there and you wait until the thing grows and you let nature do its, its, its magic, okay? Marketing is not magic, but there's a lot of similarities there. A lot of brands will say, okay, we're going to try Facebook. We're going to give it a $1,000 budget. If it doesn't work, we're out. That's so the wrong approach. <laughs> I don't like anything about that approach. Instead, what I'd recommend is say, hey, we think Facebook, based on our competitors, they're doing very well on Facebook. I think we probably would too. Great. How long are you going to give it? Uh, we'll give it a year. That's really good. How much budget? 50 grand. Okay, that's a good budget. Great. Now, are you going to hire an agency or are you going to do it yourself? How do you know how to hire the right agency? But give it the right amount of time, which is typically 12 to 24 months, and give it the right amount of budget to make sure that you really are giving it a fair shot. All right, let's dive into the math, okay? The fun part, every, everybody's fun part, right? The math. I actually, I'm kind of a math nerd, so I, I actually like the math part. Um, this is going to get kind of complicated. So that's why I put more of it onto a slide, but let me, we'll start small, walk into it, and then we'll kind of start to wrap up here and go to a Q&A so you guys can ask questions and I can help with your specific situation. Okay, so let's just use that example. We'll go back to selling couches to the 60-year-old female who lives in a suburban area who is on, you know, all the websites she's on, okay? Let's say that we want to target her, okay? And let's say we're going to run Facebook ads to her. We're going to do SEO and we're going to run ads on house. Okay. Whatever, whatever the, the audience is. All right. So step one, determine how much you're willing to spend on ads to attract customers. How do you do this intelligently? Well, you could finger in the wind. I'll spend hundred bucks, you know, per conversion. I don't recommend that. Do it this way. Take your LTV, which is your lifetime value. Okay. So your product, all right. Whatever your product is, how much is your average sale and how many average sales will you make to your average customer? Okay. So for he, I'll use healing as an example. So our average client spends $40,000 a year, let's say. Okay. It's probably a little higher than that, but let's just use that. Number, okay. And do they spend that one time or do they spend that for multiple years? So then for us to calculate our LTV, we'd say, okay, they spend 40,000, but for how many years? Oh, they go an average of four years. Okay. That'd be $160,000. Okay. So then that's our LTV. Maybe you sell a health food supplement on Amazon for $25. That's great. That's your, your, your average customer sales, $25. How many times do they buy? Oh, they'll buy 30 times in their lifetime. Oh, okay. So what is that? $600? or something like that, more, no, more than that, six, uh, 750, 
That's $750, okay? So your LTV is 750. So you can think about your, your total lifetime value. Why does that matter more? Because it's okay if they're gonna spend $750 over the course of their engagement with your brand, you can spend 50 or 70 or $100 on ads, even if your first conversion is completely unprofitable because you know they're gonna buy 25 more containers of your you know, superfood supplement or whatever it is, right? So it's okay to lose money on the first conversion because you know you'll make it up later. Helium does this with our sales team. So when we sell a deal, right, we have, we have commission, we, we are less profitable on deals the first three months because all the upfront work and all of us go into it, but we don't care because we know if they go three or four years, we'll eventually make it up after enough billings, but we won't make money at the beginning, okay, because of all the upfront fees. That's okay. We know our LTV is high enough to make it work. That's all you guys need to figure out for your brand. So lifetime value is how much is your average sale and how many times will that customer buy from you, okay? Once you have your LTV and you feel confident, it's okay if you want to underestimate, like, ah, it's our average sale is $300 and I think they'll buy two. Okay, then just say it's 600. Don't, don't overestimate. It's better to be conservative because you don't want to lose money on ads, right? Or lose a lot of money on ads. Number two is start small and test. So now you've got your LTV. So let's just say your LTV, keep the math easy, is $100. Okay, so your lifetime value is 100 bucks and your product is $10. Just keep the math super simple. Don't waste your whole budget on one platform, okay? When you're starting out and you're trying to test, don't put it all into Facebook and then like YOLO Facebook and, <laughs> and do nothing else, okay? Put some into Facebook, put some into Google Organic, put some into, you know, Snapchat, WhatsApp, whatever the different platforms are you're gonna advertise on. Put some in different places and see which one does better. Um, Typically, the first one you try is not the best one, okay? Uh, I recommend start with smaller budgets and test until you become profitable on sales. Then you scale up till you hit a point of diminishing returns, okay? So what that means is, let's say you figure out that Facebook is a good platform for you. You're making money on, on the ads. You're becoming profitable. There will be, like any curve up, there'll be a law of diminishing returns, where there'll be a point to which, you know, maybe you're spending $10,000 a month on Facebook ads. There's a point to which going above will not add any more sales, but you will spend more money on ads. Um, I don't have time on this talk to get into how you determine that, but there, there are formulas for that. Google ads has a really good one for that, that it'll, the keyword planner and budget planner will actually tell you like, hey, above $10,000 a month spend for this term, you, you don't, we, we really don't drive any more conversions. Cool, right? Because you've, you've kind of maximized your audience. Um, there's a lot of dimension returns. So that's, don't worry about that at the moment. That will happen. Okay. Um, number three is analytics are key. Don't spend all this and, and not have your analytics set up. So if you've got a website, get Google Analytics. So you've got Google Analytics, Facebook Analytics, you have Google Ads, you have ClickFunnels, you have Crazy Egg, you have Hotjar. These, these are ones I would recommend using. Um, and the list is right here if you, you know, I can send you the slides once again. But use analytic tools. Many of these are free or very inexpensive, right? 10 bucks a month or whatever. Um, Use the free and cheap tools to make sure you're tracking everything because the key to ads is data, right? Knowing the math, but knowing the data. If you look at it and you say, oh, I ran $1,000 in ads. I used Hotjar to, to see how people engaged with my page. They came, scrolled right to the bottom and then left. Okay, what does that mean? Was that, did I run it to the wrong person or is my page like really boring? They didn't see what they wanted to see. Let me go look at some of my competitors landing pages. Oh, they've got a video and a really long sales page. I don't have that. Well, maybe I should have that because the data shows that they're just bouncing instantly. Okay, I should probably do this better. So data is really important, okay? Now, step three. So once you have picture LTV, you've decided to, to start small and test, testing different platforms. You've started to figure out the platform that works, okay, or a couple of platforms that work. Now go to step three. You take your LTV or your lifetime value, minus your CAC or customer acquisition cost, sometimes called CAC, right? Equals your profit per customer. Now, let's keep it simple. We'll use that example again. Your LTV is hundred bucks, okay? Your, your sale is $10 and they're gonna buy from you 10 times. So it's LTV is hundred bucks, your sales $10. Customer acquisition cost is however many dollars it costs for you to get the customer. So if you're spending, let's say $8 on Facebook ads, to get your $10 sale, your customer acquisition cost would be $8, okay? Because you spent $8 in ads to get the sale. In this case, your 
your CAC would be $8, your LTV is $100, so your profit per customer here would be $92. Does that make sense? Take your LTV minus your CAC, okay? So in that case, you say, oh, I'm willing to spend $8 to drive $92. Yeah, great, okay? You don't want it to be upside down though. So if your customer acquisition cost in this case is $105 and your LTV is $100, then you're underwater. Not to get too complicated here, but there's you can look at this either on revenue or on profit, okay? Some brands look at it in terms of revenue, okay? We sell, we, have, we sell exercise equipment for $1,000 and our customer acquisition cost has to be $300 because if we can get it for $300, we could sell it for a thousand and those are the revenue numbers we need. Okay, great. Some brands do it on profit, okay? It's probably better to do it on profit. So let's say, let's use the $100, $100 LTV. So you have an LTV at 100, you sell something for $10, but it costs you $3 to make it, okay? So your $3 cost of goods is, is revenue, but not profit. $7 in profit on that $10 item costs you $3. Well, that means you should probably factor in that your, your actual cost or sale is $7, not 10, but $7 of profit. So now you can't spend more than $7 at CAC or you, you, don't, you don't break even, you lose money. I'm not trying to super complicate this, guys, but I'm hoping this is making sense. Um, for small brands, I recommend you look at it on profit, not on just revenue. So if the profit of your product, your customer acquisition cost has to be lower than the profit you would make on the individual product. If you can get that ratio to work, your ads are going to be awesome because you can confidently spend money knowing I can get new customers at a cheaper rate than the profit I make on a new sale. If you know they're going to buy it a bunch of times, don't worry about the profit on the new sale. Just worry about getting them in the door at a lower ratio than your total LTV. Okay. I hope that's simple. I'm going to answer questions as we go if that's super not, if that's super not clear. Step four is try new platforms as they become available. So when Snapchat comes out, TikTok comes out, when whatever the new social media is, okay, try it. Run some ads on it. Put a thousand dollar budget or 3,000 or whatever your, you know, whatever size you are, put some budget towards it and try it. Just see, right? Run some ads. Like what's, what's the worst that can happen? I always recommend trying new platforms just to see because you never know if that's the like, oh, this was an awesome platform. This worked perfectly, right? You never know if that's that's the way it is or, you, you know, you try it and it doesn't do anything. You know, what do you have to lose, right? So I always recommend um, trying new platforms. All right. This is a... Hopefully not complicated, but I'm going to walk you guys through this. How do you decide which platform to pick and how do you pick new platforms? And how do I kind of know where, where to market? Okay. So this is a very common graph of the, the market when you're marketing. Uh, I forgot this is called it, not the innovator's dilemma. This, there's a name for this, but I forgot what the official name is. Maybe someone in chat can <laughs> remind me what the name of this is. But this is a graph of basically <clears throat> when you're putting a new product out there. Um, the, the way the market's going to react to it. So at the very beginning, when you when you have a, any tech or any new thing, you're going to have your early market, okay? We got a chat. Crossing the chasm. Thank you, Maurice. Appreciate it. This is crossing the chasm. Thank you. So when you when you, when you you have a new product, okay, so let's say you invented a new exercise device that's 60 bucks and you're going to sell them on Facebook, okay? You're going to have your innovators, your guys who are super, super into to anything fitness and anything new, and they're going to buy your product sight unseen. They don't care. They're going to try it, okay? Because they're just absolute enthusiasts, okay? This, this is tech enthusiasts because this is typically used in SaaS and tech products, but this can work for any, any enthusiast of any, of any product, okay? You get your innovators, 2.5% at the beginning. They will try anything, okay? They'll try anything, everything. They just want to try new stuff. They love new stuff, okay? They know there's going to be bugs. It's not all perfectly worked out yet. They don't care. They want to try new stuff, okay? Then 13.5% are your early adopters, okay? They're not going to do the newest of the newest thing just because it's the newest thing, but they, they are very close behind that. They're, they're the you know, early adopters that are like, ooh, I wanna try new things, but it doesn't, they don't have to do the new thing just to do the new thing. They do the new thing they're interested in. When you add these two up, right? You get 16, 17% of the market. That's your early buyers, okay? This chasm, right, crossing the chasm, this chasm is the big jump between a very small startup that doesn't make it and a mainstream company that can jump into the mainstream market. 
So use Uber, for example, when Uber first started, right? It was a really weird concept. Like, wait, I go on my phone or my computer and I order some random, random black car to pick up my house. How do I feel like I'm going to do that, right? It's really expensive. It's really high end. It started as a black car limousine service for high end people in Silicon Valley, right? To take them to their, to their airport. Okay, great. Well, that was a limited market, okay? When they then went mainstream and they said, hey, we're going to have people drive their own cars, early adopters were like, ooh, this is cool. I'm going to try this. They picked it up. The conservatives and skeptics would never have gotten in some other random guy's car off of an app, like never in a million years, okay? They're never going to do that. They're only going to do it once it's so mainstream that it's like old news, then they will try it, okay? So Uber had to win with these guys right here, the vision we're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll get this guy's car. It's cheaper than a taxi. I don't have to wait. Yeah, that's cool. I'll do that. They crossed the chasm, though, and they became the early majority. They got, they got a product that a lot of, you know, 34% of, of now the normal market was like, yeah, I'll try this. This is, this is kind of cool. And they tried it, and they liked it, and then they broke into the conservative market. I don't know if they're in the laggard market yet, but the majority of people use a, a rideshare service now, right? Uber, Lyft, Juno, whatever. Okay. Um, this is where you need to win, this crossing this chasm. So you get past innovators, visionaries, and then you can get here. This is the majority of your market. It's the bell curve. You know, the, the two thirty-four percent of the practices and the conservatives. Okay. How's this apply to you? When you're picking a new platform, okay, I bet you you could probably look at your market and you could probably pick out which of your buyers are in these categories. Okay. So let's go back to the example of you're selling couches to 60-year-old females, okay? They're probably not likely to be your, your innovator or early adopter of the newest of the newest couch technology. Maybe they are. I don't know. But maybe not, okay? They're prob probably more likely to be in your early or late majority, okay? Well, where do those people spend time? What websites are they on, okay? Because if I'm going for my visionaries or innovators, I'm going to be marketing on TechCrunch. I'm going to be on, you know... So, you know, Silicon Valley news. I want to be where the innovators are spending time. Okay. Discord, TechCrunch, you know, whatever. That's not where the 60 year old female wants to buy a couch is spending her time. So when you when you talk about picking your platforms as well, you could also back up this way and say, Hey, who are my audience and where would they follow this curve? Those people probably spend time in these places online. And this is probably where I'm going to get conversions. So to, to boil it down, I wouldn't take a conservative late majority type person here and try to sell them a really innovative technology. Probably not going to work, but would be great to market to them something they already believe in, like shoes or couches or, you know, windows or, or basic products that are not super new, early stage, early stream. Okay. Does this make sense? Hope this makes sense. And then if, you're, if your product is going to sell really well to visionaries, pick platforms where visionaries spend a lot of their time online and you're probably going to get better results. Okay, with that, uh, I want to go to Q and A because I know we have some time left. But always, I've always found that the Q and A is the most helpful part for people because they have their individual questions. So um, I'd like to open it up, Matt. How do we open it up for uh, people to? Can people just unmute themselves and ask questions? Does that work? I think that anybody that. Um they could use the raise their hand feature and I can click on anybody to allow to talk. Great. Let's do that. So who has questions they would like to ask? Alex. Hey, Tim, can you, can you hear me? I can. Hi, hey, Alex. We can hear you, Alex. Hey, Matt. hey um, thanks for the presentation. This is really great. Um, I'd have a question about uh, the determining the lifetime value part of product. So, as a yes, I have a fairly new business. We just started in the spring. We're selling edible cookie dough, and <clears throat> you know we've we've been we've been up and running for about six months, and um, you know the majority of our sales have come through you know in person like farm markets and stuff. And I've got some, you know, information about like average spend and number of customers and things like that for, um, you know, through our, through our Square app. But how do I, if I want to think about like my lifetime value, how do I kind of estimate what that's going to be as a new business owner? It's a great question. 
Um, that's a cool idea. Edible cookie dough. I love that. I'm going to need to try some of your edible cookie dough. <laughs> my, my wife and daughter and I would, and my son would love that. Um, okay. Um, do you, so Alex, have you monetized yet? Do you have a like product package? You know how much you're selling or do you have all that already? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we've, do you mean in terms of like an ad, like an ad service or just what are No. Sales? Yeah. Like if I were to go buy your product, how much does it cost? Oh uh, yeah. It's uh, so we have a couple of different options. You can buy a, a regular 12 ounce jar for $9 and we, then we have a variety pack with four different smaller size jars. It's $20. Okay, great. So let, let's just use the $20 to, to make it easy. So, so I go buy the variety, variety pack for $20. Um, that's great. Do you, so your question is, if, if your if your sale is twenty dollars, as you say, how right. many times will your average customer buy to get to your LTV? Is that, is that your question? Yes. Okay. So you're only six months old, so you're smart in saying you don't know your LTV because you're probably right. It's probably hard to prove out yet, and you probably don't have loyalty programs and enough of like brand building with the customers yet, where they're on repeat orders and they like I gotta have this stuff. This is my jam, right? Um, but you will, you are going to build that. So you probably don't know yet. Um, can you predict have in the six months you've been running, have you seen any type of like trends? I'll give you a couple examples. Some products like that people buy once and they love it, but they never rebuy. Or are you seeing the people who buy like, Oh, this is great. And they, and they come back and buy 10 more times. Like what are you seeing in terms of people's buying apps? I think we've we've got we've definitely got you know some customers who we've identified or have become sort of fans and they're repeat customers. Um, you know we get feedback from folks who come to the markets who say you know we saw you were going to be here this is the reason we came. Um, but I you know I think a majority are probably just the one time buyers. Okay, so this so if it was me, this is what I would do. So number one is I would uh, I would I would do three things. Number one is I would determine how much money am I willing to invest in marketing, whether or not I'm running profitable ads. Um, because at the beginning stage where you are now, there is like back to our own SEO example, we spent thousands and thousands of dollars in advance through our own SEO before it ever yielded a single dollar in revenue. That was just a, a decision, right? That was a marketing decision of it. We were investing, right? We knew it would eventually pay off, but we were spending all the money in advance. In your case, I would set aside a marketing budget to say, I'm going to spend this on marketing regardless of what it drives, right? The reason I would start there is because you don't yet know the potential, in my opinion, of what the LTV could be. You could have people who order this every month and they order it for five years and they eat it every single month and they love it. And your, your LTV could be $1,200, right? Your LTV could be $30. They buy a variety pack and a single pack one time, they love it, but they forget about it or they don't see it on the shelf of where they buy on, on and they don't buy it again. So we, I don't think you know yet. Um, so what I would do is just set aside, a, so maybe you say like $1,000, $5,000, whatever it is, okay? I would set aside the budget. The second is I would try to guesstimate what, it, what it's gonna be. So think about that average buying cycle. You say like, yeah, people are gonna come to the farmer's market, they're gonna buy two of them and then until we are on Whole Foods shelves, we're not going to get a lot of repeat buys. So try to be really realistic with yourself about that. And then say my LTV is $40. I need to buy ads accordingly. Um, I would try to be a little bit more skeptical, a little bit less, like more, more pessimistic on that than, than super optimistic. And then make sure your, your customer acquisition cost is not more than $40. Um, that would be the other way you could do it. The third thing that I would do is I would try to boost my LTV through some kind of customer loyalty program. So getting direct to consumer. So you, they buy it at the farmer's market and then you get, you know, find a way to be there to get their email address or their info. So you can add them to the list and say, hey, we can send this to you once a quarter. You get a discount, you buy right from our, our Shopify store. We just mail it right to your house. Like, oh, it's such a good idea. I love it. I want to sign up. Awesome. And then you get that kind of customer loyalty program would be really good for recurring revenue and it'd be really good for your LTV. So that would be how I would do it. Um, but you are going to have to guess a little bit because you don't have enough data yet. 
Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. Um, and when it comes to advertise, like an advertising budget, is there like a is there like a minimum amount, or is there a point where it's like you know you need to spend at least this much, or you just can't expect any kind of results? Or like you're, you're you know you mentioned like a thousand dollars. That's probably high for me at this you know at this stage. But you know, should I? Is there like a minimum that I should be thinking it's where if I go below that, it's not even really worth it. Um, that's a good question. It, it really, I would say Alex depends on the platform. So a thousand dollars in Facebook ads can take you pretty far. A thousand dollars in SEO. Don't even start. Don't, don't, don't spend any, if you can't spend tens of thousands in SEO, I wouldn't do it because it, it, it's just really expensive. It's very slow and it, it, it costs a lot of money to compete in Google because it's such a widely used and difficult platform to market on. Um, but a thousand bucks in Facebook ads can go really far. Um, so I guess two things to that, the low, the smaller your budget is, I would go social media before I would go other platforms. I wouldn't do native ads. I wouldn't do programmatic and I wouldn't do Google if your budget's small because those budgets get eaten up super fast. Um, number two is a minimum. That's a good question. I don't, there's not really a minimum. That's like kind of saying like, what's, how much should I pay for a house? Like, I don't know, it depends on your budget and how big and where you want to live, right? Um, so I, it's hard to answer that, but I can tell you that um, most of the effective marketing campaigns you're going to run, I have seen this over the years, really cheap marketing just doesn't generally work. Um, so I have usually told people, to not spend money until they're able to invest a more significant sum. Um, I'll use the SEO one as a good example. There's people who say, hey, I talked to this company. They, they do SEO for $3.99 a month, $399. Should I do it? I say, don't do it. Because I've seen those programs. They basically don't do anything. And so I told them, just wait until you can spend $3,000 a month and, and, and invest the real amount that's going to work. Don't spend $2.99 because... I've, in 10 years, I've seen it time and time again. It just doesn't do anything. They change a little bit of metadata on your website and your traffic doesn't go up at all. And it's literally better not to spend it because then you're not angry and you didn't waste the money. So for the various platforms, what I would say, Alex, you could Google and kind of find if there's a recommend, like Quora is a good place to go. If you've ever been to Quora, you can Google like, what's the minimum recommended Facebook budget? What's the minimum recommended budget on LinkedIn or whatever? Um, people will have some good advice for you there, but I would typically say if your budgets are, are less than a few hundred dollars a month, I would probably hold off until you have a little bit more market budget. Okay. No, yeah, that is helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. I know we have other hands in chat. So, um, Alex, thank you for your question. Great question. Who else? We have a hand for uh, Moab Productions. Greetings, greetings, how's everyone? Thank you so much for the uh, the great content. Uh, this is Alamo. I was calling in or speaking in. I uh, had a question about the SEO and starting the SEO. Is it a keyword structure? And you know, we were just started, and we want to make sure that the, the SEO is correct, and we want to understand the keywording, things like that. Do you have any advice? on that i do do you mind if i pull up your website live yes uh cordova concepts.com i spell that correctly c-o-r-d-o-v-a and then concepts.com okay. all right i'm gonna pull up so here's a tool that i that i use um it's called ahrefs this this tool allows us to kind of see all of the seo uh details on the back end so we're going to pull this up here real quick. Um, this tool, it's not the cheapest out there. There's like SEMrush, there's Moz, but this one's by far the best. Okay. Oh. All right. So Elegant Hamming in Home Goods. Oh, this is great. This is super cool. Oh, this is awesome. Moab Production. Love it. This is great. I love the simplicity of it. Okay, so if if you're looking to, is this is this built on like a, a Squarespace or Wix? Or, Absolutely, or? yeah, Squarespace, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. 
Um, those are great to start out with. Um, those are a great way to start because they're really inexpensive. And Google is what's called CMS agnostic or content marketing management system. They don't care which CMS you use. They just care about whether you follow the SEO principles or not. So you don't have to spend a ton of money building a WordPress website. You can totally start with Squarespace and it's a totally good way to do it. Okay. Um, okay. A couple pieces of advice. Um, and I will pull the presentations on this, but I'll kind of give you the basics. Okay. Um, when you want to rank, what, what's a, what's a keyword you want to rank for at Google? Handmade. Handmade what? Handmade, um, art. We have handmade art prints. We have handmade ceramics. Let's do ceramics. Handmade ceramic tiles. Ceramics. Ceramic tiles. Okay. All right. So let me give a quick breakdown here. Um, okay. this is, this is what I do every day. So this one will be easy. Um, you, you gave <laughs> me right. a, you gave me a nice meatball. Thank you. You know, kind of lop it up there for you. It's great. Yeah. Like, oh, great. That's what I do every day. This is easy. Okay. Um, so, so let's go here real quickly. So just to make sure everyone knows. So you go to Google and search handmade ceramic tiles. Okay. On average, this one, you can kind of see the trend search interest. So, so it gets a, you know, decent peaks, but at like different peaks in, around the year. Um, these are going to be your ads right here. So there's four ads being run. Um, and we'll pull up here to get a good idea. So this gets about 300 searches per month in Google. The average cost per click is $1.60. Uh, that people are paying to click uh, and on average let's see what we uh paid gets about five percent of the traffic 31 percent of people skip and go directly to organic and then no clicks are 56 percent the reason for that is people look here and they, they kind of go and look at some of these pictures or they look at some of the tile stuff or they go here to find tile providers and then they don't click on anything and then they leave okay so Absolutely. that could that could be because they don't know exactly what they're for they're like handmade ceramic tiles like oh no a handmade subway tiles like and they just don't know what they want yet so they're kind of sure. looking um but that that means this keyword specifically if you were to pay to run ads you would get about five percent of the, the search volume you did organic you, you could access about 31 percent okay so let's kind of go down here and show you a couple things so uh, i'm going to show you this so google i'll keep i'll make seo really simple it's probably been really complicated for people over the years there are 220-ish ranking factors um, that Google looks at. Age of your website, number of backlinks, how many referring domains are sending you backlinks, how many social signals you have, dwell time. So many factors, okay? Yes. We have studied this and studied this and studied this at Helium. We have engineers, we reverse engineer Google's algorithm, we work on this stuff intensively. It all boils down to two things. The content on your website and how relevant that is for the keyword you want to go for and the number of backlinks pointing to your pages that drive authority. It's about authority and relevance. That's what they all boil down to. And all of the ranking factors are in one of those two buckets. So I'm going to show you that. So if we look at, so this is the, the ranking. So it's fire clay tile, mercury mosaics. So we look here, go down. Fire clay tile, mercury mosaics, walker, zanger, okay? So let's go to these guys and let's just kind of see what you're up against. So we took, we put in handmade ceramic tile was our keyword. Okay. Nope. I don't want to become a friend of Fireplay. All right. So let's, let's quickly look at what is called the three Kings of SEO. So the three Kings of SEO, we go to Google is about relevance of your page. So if I hover over here, this is going to give me the title tag of the website, which is going to be the title of the page. In this case, it's handmade tile. So it doesn't say ceramic, but it has handmade tile there. And then they have their name, fire tile. So that's your, that's your title tag. This is probably their H1. So let me inspect. Their heading, yeah. Yeah, that's their main heading. Okay. So uh, the three kings of SEO are your title tag, your H1 tag, and your URL. Okay. Uh -huh. And the URL is right here. So if you're going to build a page for SEO, the three things you want to always get right on any page are put your keyword in your title right here when you title your page in Squarespace. The URL, when you pick your URL, you'd want it to be for yours, cordovaconcepts.com forward slash handmade ceramic tile. I would make okay. it the exact keyword, okay? You put little hashes in between them or whatever. Because the closer you get that keyword in the URL, the title, and the H1, all you do to Google's algorithm is tell the bot, hey, I'm really relevant for this term, right? Because the bot's just 
looking through the website, trying to figure out what you're relevant for, right? Absolutely. So this is their H1. So if you look at theirs really quickly, they have handmade tile, fire clay tile, and then tile. So they didn't, this is good for you. Their, their optimization is not perfect because they're, this, these are not really competitive keywords. So they haven't nailed it. That's great for you because that means you can beat them. And then they have handmade tile. And if you look on the page here, they've got a decently long page with probably 300 words of content, okay? So once you get the three kings of SEO right, title tag, URL, H1, then what you want to do is use this thing called word counter, word counter, okay? So we're going we're gonna to use uh, uh, this one, okay? No, 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 I want the, yeah, now where's the online one? Uh, word counter tag, no, that one's broken. <laughs> where's, my, where's my free word counter tool, is it gone? Word counter for website. There we go, wordcounter.net, there we go. So take okay. their take their page, put it in this, this, this wordcounter.net, throw it in here real quick and it'll tell you how many words they have on the page. They have 1,156 words. So this is a real simple, real simple chat, uh, hack you can use. Google okay. thinks longer content is better than shorter content. So get your, get your keyword in the three kings, title, URL, H1, then just build a page with more content than theirs. Okay. okay, make it 1,200 gotcha. words because Google's like, oh, this is longer. This must be better, okay? Then the kicker is let's look at fire clay tile. This page, they have a DR of 64. That's, that's bad for you. That's competitive, okay? okay? So DR goes from zero to 100, and it's, and it's like a logarithmic. So it's the higher up you get, the more competitive it becomes. Sure. They have, they have 48 backlinks to this page, but they have a DR of 64. Okay. that's really competitive. So that means they have tons and tons and tons of backlink work that they've done to send a lot of backlinks to their website. So I'll here, I'll just show you this and not to, I won't spend too much more time on this because I want to make sure everyone else gets their questions. No worries. Uh, yes, everyone, very, very, very valuable. Thank you. No, totally. It, unless everyone wants me to keep going on this, um, I'm happy to keep digging into SEO stuff, but <laughs> I want to make sure people have time for their questions. Uh, let's just grab theirs. I want to show you this real quick. So. So this was yours. So right now your site's new, right? We're to have a concept. Correct. Yes, yes has a, exactly. Has a DR of zero, which is fine. That's exactly where everybody starts. The challenge for, for you though, if you want to rank against uh, above Fireplay Tile, their SEO is not very good, but look at that. They have almost 4,000 backlinks, which are other websites that point a link to their website, which are okay. hard to get. They're getting about 6.2 thousand organic visitors per month. So this, this is going to be difficult. So it's, so, the, the good news is you can beat them. The bad news is that it will take time. Sure. You also, though, could at the beginning, you could buy ads, right? So you could you could go back here. If we, I don't know, uh, go back to yours. I think I searched for, oh, yeah, handmade top. You're right. You could buy these ads up here. And so you might say, hey, it's going to take me a couple of years to beat them in organic, but I could buy ads and I could be up here because the ads were like, what, a buck 70 a click, right? Correct, correct. It wasn't like that bad. Uh, 160 a click. So that's probably doable. So where I would start is I would I would build the page, get my H1, my title, my URL, get the keyword in it. I would build, build a 1200 word page with better content than theirs, make a nice long page. And then I would go to friends and family and organizations I belong to, everybody and try to get them to link to my page, right? Hey, can you help me out with the link to my site? Once that is done, then you got to start doing link building to build as many links to that page as possible. I don't have time to get into that, but if you want to learn more about link building, just you know, email me after my, my emails on the slides. That's a whole service Helium offers. It's complicated to do link building, but okay. that's what you'd have to do because link building is what builds your domain rating, which is why they have a 64. They've done a ton of link building. Awesome. That's how you beat them. To start out, what I would do is I would put some budget to ads and try to outrank in the ads and see if you can get conversions from ads. If sure. you prove out like, oh, I'm, I'm making money on these ad conversions, this is great. Then I would probably invest in the SEO piece. It's gonna take you 12 to 24 months to beat Fireplay. Sure, awesome. Okay, great, great, great. Wonderful, wonderful. That's very, very helpful. Absolutely, hope that answers your question. Absolutely, it sure did. And thanks for everyone on. Thanks for the moderator. Thanks for all the, uh, the teams on, thank you. Absolutely.
All right, so I think we have time. Matt, are we gonna do we have a hard stop at 1045 is what I was aware of, or is, is it is it do we have to 11? Um, I don't think we have a, a hard stop per se. Uh, oh, okay. I don't see any more hands uh, raised. So if there's anything else you'd like to do, um, we'd be game for it or we could wrap it up. Okay, so I did, there's a, I'm looking through chat here. Uh, we had Maurice, uh, Maurice asked, is the trend data graph a plugin you're using for Chrome? Yes, um, that's a great question. So I use this plugin right here called Keywords Everywhere. Um, Keywords Everywhere, it directly connects to Google Ads and it will pull all of this trend data. Uh, you can also click and find long tail keywords. Um, so, oh, I'm out of credit, so I have to buy, I have to buy more credits. But it'll, it'll help you find all these long tail keywords. And uh, once I buy more credits, because I guess I'm out of them, um, it will also, under, under the search bar right here, Maurice, it'll actually just directly pull up Google's search volume and the average cost per click in Google, which is super helpful for me because if I'm like doing meetings or I'm doing these events, I could pull it up and, and yeah, I guess I got purchase credits here, but right here, it'll just tell me Google's numbers. I'm like, oh, this gets a thousand searches a month and it's an average cost per click $4. It's just really helpful. It pulls up without me having to go to Google uh, Keyword Tool. Yeah, so it's again, keywords everywhere. Um, I think there's a free version. Um, I've got the paid version, but it's like $10 for a million credits or something. So it's like, really inexpensive. All right, I have another, I have a few more minutes. Um, do we have any other questions people would like to ask, whether it's SEO related, SEM, other ad platforms? I'm happy to go for another uh, three, four minutes. We don't have to go if people don't have questions, but does anybody else have questions they wanna ask? Nope, doesn't look like it. I think uh, I think Matt, everybody's questions are all done. So I will um, go back to the last one here. So if anybody uh, would like, um, this is my email address here on this last slide, I'll present it. Yeah, Mo, I would like some cookie dough. I second that. Um, so Alex, let me know where I can buy the cookie dough. Um, that would be, I, I need more cookie dough in my life. Um, this is my email address, guys, um, tim at heliumseo.com and I'll hype it here in the middle. If you guys have any questions, you'd like to see the slides, um, you know, you'd like to talk offline about questions that you have, feel free to send me an email. I'd love to connect. I'm happy to help and add value wherever I can. So feel free to reach out with any questions.